Yep. Hi. Thanks, everyone. I'm Tim Eustridge, and I'm excited to talk about using Neo4j to build knowledge graphs on USPTO data. So let's jump right in. Our agenda for today, we're going to start with an introduction, go over the schema design in Neo4j. You do a beginner use case on simplifying complex legal text, an intermediate use case on identifying patent infringement, and then an advanced use case with predicting future innovations using those embeddings. So as an introduction, like I said, I'm Tim Eastridge. I'm a data scientist, graph enthusiast, entrepreneur, author. Uh, here's a, a QR code to uh, the book that was published earlier this year, Graph Data Science with Python and Neo4j. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. And I'm a husband and father of two amazing kids. First, I want to start with the fundamentals of patents, because I think we've all heard of patents, but not all of us know exactly what patents are or why they're useful. So I'll just do one slide on patents. Patents are exclusive rights granted to inventors for their novel, non-obvious ideas. They protect intellectual property and are intended to foster innovation. Although I put an asterisk there because people debate whether or not patents really foster innovation or if they stifle innovation. Uh, and then patents, they're difficult to understand at large volumes. So this approach that we'll review today will help us digest large amounts of patent data in a more uh, easily understood way. So what are some different use cases for storing patents in a graph database like Neo4j? First, we can simplify these technical documents and we can also do things like automated monitoring in a database so that if new patents are published and they cite one of your previous patents, you can get an automatic update. Also storing in a graph database helps with portfolio optimization because you can identify gaps in your organization. So some companies and organizations will have hundreds, sometimes thousands of patents. And so it quickly becomes difficult to analyze all these patents across the landscape. So storing in a graph database, as we'll see, can help with portfolio optimization. Uh, we can use LLMs to draft provisional patents using this graph data structure and we can identify emerging trends and technologies by looking at how things are shifting using their embeddings. So next, let's look at the schema for how we have designed this graph database for patent exploration. So at the center of this wheel and spoke model, we have the patent document. The patent document is linked to patent claims, and the claims are very important because they are the pieces of text linked to a patent that actually claim uh, what's legally binding and upheld. There's a topic about the, the patent. There's the embedding, uh, which is a high dimensional representation of the, the text. We'll talk about that more in a minute. There's the attorney linked to the patent document, the assignee, which is the, the company or who owns the patent. There's the inventor and which can often be multiple inventors linked to a patent. And then there's, of course, the location, what country, et cetera, is the patent in. And then finally, there are relationships from patent documents to other patent documents, which is this circular relationship, meaning a patent can cite a different patent. So there's patent citations. So if you come up with a novel idea, you are required to cite other uh, inventions along the way that helped come up with, with your idea. And, and that way, as the patent examiner is looking over your patent, they can assess, is this truly a new and novel uh, concept? And then finally, K and N stands for K nearest neighbor. So based off of the um, embeddings of the patent, we can find similar patents as well. So on this slide, I want to show Bloom. Um, which is Neo4j's business intelligence tool and enables us to explore data. I think this is a really helpful representation of this graph schema that we looked at in the previous slide because it shows how patents are a really dynamic interconnected web of information. So uh, a 
a patent is linked to an inventor and that inventor could have multiple patents. Um, it's also linked to an organization which can have patents that are similar to other organizations. So you can kind of compare how similar are two different organizations to each other based off of their, their patents. So, um, so yeah, this is a, a nice overview of kind of how we can use Bloom to explore some of this data that's within the graph database. And on the right side over here, we can see some of the nodes that we have in our database, the topic, the location, inventor, document, and assignee. All right, next, let's look at an example of simplifying the complex legal text with large language models. So using the API from, from OpenAI, ChatGPT, we can take these complicated patent abstracts, which the, the legal teams um, intentionally make them a little bit difficult to read. So if, if you're like me and you've tried to read patents in the past, quickly becomes overwhelming and difficult to do, right? Because uh, there's a lot of jargon in here and you know, like, okay, what is this patent really talking about? And so this is um, a, a simple example, but powerful because we have a, a complicated patent text here says an apparatus for removing weeds from an aesthetic mulch garden, et cetera, et cetera. And like, okay, what is this really talking about? It's a robot with machine vision removing weeds from a garden. It's like, okay, got it. So next we can do RAG for similarity search and identify infringement. So RAG stands for retrieval augmented generation, and it's a method to rapidly and effectively run semantic search. So there's a tool here that runs uh, against Neo4j at the back end. And so we could put in a, a description of the type of patent that we're looking for. So in this case, a blockchain based system that authenticates and records conversations. And so then we can do a RAG search, which is it's a search, right? And recommend the most similar patents to to our search text. And then we can see a similarity score here, which is the cosine similarity of the embeddings of uh, what we put into our search phrase here, and then the embeddings that are stored in the graph database. And so we could see there is a 97% similarity between the embedding here and then what uh, was returned. So once we have data stored in these embeddings, which I included a screenshot of what these embeddings look like, these are what we call high dimension, right? Because every comma between each of these numbers represents a different dimension. So these, these are huge high dimensional representations of this text. But once we have it stored as a number, we can reduce that uh, numeric array down to two dimensions and plot it here in this two-dimensional representation of embeddings. So we're using an algorithm called UMAP, which is great for reducing down to two dimensions these embeddings. And it's uh, so if you're similar with, uh, familiar with PCA, it's that same concept of dimensionality reduction. But UMAP is a great algorithm for embedding dimensionality reduction. And so if I click this play again here, we can see these are different clusters or communities of patents. So up here we have cancer treatment related patents. And then over here we have blockchain related patents. And then you know, smart contracts. Then over here we have dentistry related patents. So by creating embeddings and storing these embeddings in Neo4j, it opens up, opens up the opportunity to explore the whole landscape of all patents, right? Which was never before possible. And now we have the ability to look at all these patents over time and, and see how similar they are, the semantic similarity between the patents, and also look at where are the white spaces, where are the gaps between patents, right? Maybe there's new opportunity to get new patents. We can also look at trends, where are new where are patents popping up more frequently in recent years next let's look at a potential infringement example so the average patent infringement case is roughly 10 million dollars and 
infringement means you patented your idea, you stake your claim on uh, uh, on your your concept that you created. It's new and novel, and generally you get about 15 years, 20 years um, to to develop that idea. And if someone else comes and develops uh, a similar uh, product to what you have patented, then you're uh, allowed to reach out and, and seek a uh, royalty for, for what they've created, right? So this is an example where we used Neo4j to look at linkages between patents and make sure that there's no common inventor, no common assignee between the two patents, and then assess the semantic similarity using the embeddings and say, wow, these are two very similar patents that there's no citation between the patents. So typically, um, if if the patent attorney is reviewing these and they notice like, hey, this looks very similar to this other patent, you need to cite it um, or you know, it's not it's not eligible. So in this case, there's no citation, there's no overlap, but we can see that these are very two very similar patents. This one was published before this one, and it's a method or apparatus for composite yarns. So you think about uh, like the spandex material where it's um, it expands and then co contracts back to its original fiber. And so both of these patents are, are talking about that same concept. Um, now in this screenshot, I'm just showing the abstracts. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, the claims are what is really uh, enforced by the, the patent office. Uh, but the embeddings that were compared are created off of both the abstracts and the claims. So these two had a 98% a cosine similarity uh, between the two patents. And, um, and that includes the, the claims as well. All right, next, let's look at predicting future innovations. So this is exciting. This is... Uh, this is what started the whole the whole project, right? If if we have these embeddings of patents and we can we have a timestamp for when when it was patented, um, can we predict where patents are going in the future? Now, one caveat is patents often take several years uh, to get published, granted, excuse me. So you might submit your provisional patent and then might not get your non-provisional patent granted for a few years. And so there is at this time lag. But uh, in this video, we're, we're taking a look at the patents for foldable bikes in this example. We're using the coordinate layout in Bloom, which uh, enables us to use the UMAP two dimensions to plot nodes based off of um, based off of their two-dimensional representation of the embedding. And we can see here the, the distance between the nodes represents the semantic similarity, right? So these this cluster here, this red cluster, are all foldable bikes. And then if we zoom in on this cluster, this is stationary bikes. So these are all patents related to stationary bike inventions, right? Then nothing else like this has been possible before. Like we've, we've been able to run similarity searches in a uh, two-dimensional, you know, um, web-based search that we're all used to, like a Google search, and see what patents are similar to our search. But we've never been able to do to do it quite to this degree. Uh, so it's very exciting. And, and then next, we're doing a, a time series um, analysis here, where in Neo4j, we can use this slider to look at where our patents popping up uh, more recently. All right, next, uh, this is a, a tool that we built on top of the Neo4j data. And it is, this first tab is looking at the macro trends. So at a high level for green energy storage patents in this uh, typology that we ran, we're looking at uh, what are the aggregate number of patents granted for each year. And so uh, for uh, this search phrase, we see hydrogen storage has increased 200% in recent years. 
followed by battery management, thermal energy. And then here we can see a uh, time progression of how those different categories have changed over the last few years. So again, this is, this is trying to think about how do we forecast or predict where the innovations are heading. And, um, and for that, we can use something like an LSTM, which is a neural network framework for time series data and feed in the timestamp along with these embeddings to forecast where are the new patents going to occur. All right, so now we're zooming in on this red cluster. This red cluster is hydrogen storage mechanisms. And so these are all patents related to hydrogen storage. And we're gonna be, drop a pin here. So when we drop a pin, um, we wanna look at the white space, which means potential opportunity for a new novel idea, right? These are all other patents that have been published. Is there something in there where it's pulling from these similar ideas, but it's in its own right, new and novel? So when we drop that pin, we can see the K nearest neighbors here, the most similar patents to where we dropped that pin. You can see these are all hydrogen storage patents. We can see those UMAP coordinates. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Then we can click this uh, generate. I shouldn't have skipped ahead. <laughs> we can click this generate new ideas button and that will look at where, where we dropped the pin and assess the similar patents to where that pin is dropped and then um, send it through an LLM model to generate a new idea that's meant to fill that gap, fill that white space. So then it generates this Excel file and we can see here the different ideas generated by the LLM to fill that white space gap. So now this is where a subject matter expert is required to assess, is this truly a new and novel idea that fills that white space? Um, right, because we all know LLMs can hallucinate, um, they can make things up. So it's important to obviously review these results, but I, I hope that you find this approach interesting to, to think about leveraging these embeddings and the time series components to not only fill white space, but also um, come up with a new way to, to make innovation happen. All right, and that's all I have prepared for today. I've, I've got uh, a couple of QR codes here for the book, for the website, um, and I'll turn it over to Q&A.